Hello again and welcome back to more managerial accounting. In today's episode we're going to be looking at chapter 5 and what I hope to do here is to give you a general overview of what chapter 5 is all about and walk you through the demonstration problem that's at the back of the chapter. Uh, a lot of your homework problems in the exam are going to kind of revolve around what you're going to see in the demonstration problem so I thought it would be a good idea to walk through that step by step. If we look at where we've been up to now, everything we've done in chapters 2, 3, and 4 dealt with overhead cost allocation, trying to figure out how we're going to take the overhead that we've accumulated and apply it to the products that we're making. So in chapter 2, we talked about a system that was really only used by people that had a really small amount of overhead, and that was actual costing. And what happens in that system is that we gather up all our overhead in one overhead control account, and then we assign it to work in process when the period's over or when the job is done. And we said the shortcoming of that was the fact that it kind of puts us a month behind a lot of times in expressing our overhead. If we wanted something in real time, that wasn't going to be a very good system for us. In Chapter 3, we talked about normal costing, which was a little bit better. Uh, in normal costing, we developed a budgeted overhead rate, and then using one cost driver, used that to uh, kind of apply overhead to our work in process as the period went along. So it was a little bit more in real time, but the problem with that was that we were only using one cost driver. We had this big old puddle of overhead or big old bucket of overhead, and we were assigning it to all our products using one driver. So in chapter four, we talked about ABC or activity-based costing where we had a whole lot of different pools of overhead and we used those to allocate to our products using numerous drivers and it seemed like that was the best possible way to allocate overhead. So it's important to keep in mind in both chapter 3 and 4 you're still making a an overhead rate. In uh, chapter 3 we called it a predetermined or budgeted rate. In chapter 4 we called it an activity pool rate. So you're still kind of doing a little bit of math there to come up with a rate. But in any event, where we're going now, we're kind of putting that behind us and looking at what a whole system of product costing would be. So if we take all the components of a product cost, direct labor, direct material, and overhead, and put them back together, these are kind of the systems we're looking at here. So in Chapter 5, we're going to be talking about a job order system, and in Chapter 6, we're going to be talking about a process costing system. Uh, so we'll focus right now on this job order deal. To give you an idea of what kind of a business would use that, a specialty manufacturing firm or any kind of business that produces output that is not similar in nature in small batches, whether it be one or maybe just a handful of items, they're going to use a job order system. So construction would fit that bill. Um, maybe a custom motorcycle manufacturer would fit that bill anybody that's doing customized individual work to customer specifications. So the characteristics of a job order costing system, uh, costs are always going to be accumulated by the job. So we may have four or five jobs going on at once and we're going to accumulate all the costs for those jobs separately. Every job is going to be treated as a unique object and the cost of all our different jobs are going to be maintained separately. So it really is going to be a bunch of separate items going on in job order costing and all your problems will be talking about two or three different jobs. What do you need to know for chapter 5? When you get down with chapter 5 you ought to have an idea of the source documents that are going to be used in a job order costing system. Now those are in your text. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them here simply because the text shows you paper copies of those documents. And what we're seeing in manufacturing now is a move towards computer-based items where a lot of these things are going to be stored on a computer hard drive as opposed to floating around on paper. So be familiar with what the documents are. Don't necessarily memorize them, but just kind of know that the documents are the backbone of this process. Uh, journal entries, you need to be able to understand the entries uh, for a job costing system from beginning to end. And the focus is really going to be on the inventory accounts, especially work in process. And you'll see that when we do our demonstration problem. And then finally, product or material losses. We'll talk about how to handle that right now. In any kind of manufacturing environment, we're going to have errors. We're going to have problems with the uh, maybe a small, hopefully a small amount of things that come off of the line. So how do we handle those errors depends on what kind of errors they are. If we have a anticipation of loss on every job that we do, so for instance we know that there's going to be some spoilage or some defects at the end, 
we're going to include that loss in our overhead amount and just kind of consider that a cost of doing business and part of overhead. If we can specifically identify a loss or an error with a particular job, then we will charge it to the job that caused the defect. And then if it's an abnormal loss where we haven't really planned for it, we can't really identify it to a job, then we just write it off as a loss in the period that it occurs. And we'll be looking at that and some problems later on. All right, now that we got those pleasantries out of the way, let's take a look at our problem. The problem that I have in front of you is from the back of the chapter. It's the demonstration problem. You can find everything that I'm about ready to do in the back of the chapter. Uh, and they're probably asking yourself, well, why are you even taking the time to go through it? Well, I wanted to explain to you step by step everything that's happening here because a lot of your problems are going to be based on this demonstration problem, kind of follow the same ideas. So we're doing a job order costing system. We have MBS, Modern Building Solutions, and if you want to kind of pause right here and take a second to kind of read the problem, it might be a good time to do that. We have three jobs going on. We're going to complete job one during the month and then job two and three will still be in process and it gives you some details down at the bottom about their overhead rates that they've developed. We'll kind of come back to that part in a second as we need it. The problem wants you to record seven different transactions in journal entry form and then it wants you to calculate the work in process left on job two and three. So we'll look at those seven transactions step by step and explain them and hopefully at the end we'll have some kind of idea how these costs are flowing through our job order costing system. So here we go. Transaction number one, we have direct material purchased on account for 80000 Now, a lot of you, you know, I get messages from you and you talk about how you think you're making it harder than it has to be. And to be honest with you, a lot of times you really are. And so in a lot of this problem here, we're going to be using things that we learned in principles of accounting. So if you want to put on your principles of accounting hat, now would be a good time to do it. Direct material, purchased on account for eighty thousand we'd have a debit to raw material inventory the asset account eighty thousand and then a credit to accounts payable we owe eighty thousand dollars for the material we bought so that's transaction number one so far so good right number two direct materials issued to the parts fabrication department for use in the three jobs and they have a job number one job number two job number three and then they give us some data there direct material issued to the assembly department so we have two different departments we have fabrication and assembly we're given dollar amounts for the direct materials that were issued to both of those so as I said in the lecture part all these jobs are going to be accounted for separately in different accounts so if we're taking raw materials and releasing those to the two different departments your raw material is going to go down and then your work in process inventory is going to go up Here's what it's going to look like. We'll start with the parts fabrication. We'd have a debit to work in process inventory for fabrication for job one, fabrication job two, fabrication job three. So as I said, all these jobs are going to be accounted for separately in separate work in process inventory accounts. The credit is going to be the sum of those three and it's going to go to raw material inventory because we pulled all that stuff out of raw material and put it into process. Now, what I've done, and you may want to do this at home, I've actually set all this up in T accounts so I can keep track of everything. So here's my terrible handwriting. I've got work in process inventory, job one, job two, and job three. I've got work in process inventory for assembly, job one, two, and three. I've got an account for finished goods inventory. We'll need that later on. And then I've got manufacturing overhead for the assembly department manufacturing overhead for the fab department and cost of goods sold. Man, I terrible handwriting. Anyhow, so let's go back to the journal entry. Work in process inventory, fab one, fab two, and fab three, and then raw material inventory. So we need to book eight thousand, fourteen, and forty five thousand. So I'm just going to come back over here to my T accounts. And again, we're doing this to keep track. Eight thousand. Fourteen thousand. Forty-five thousand. There we have that. The second part of that entry, and that's just for the fabrication part. The second part we're going to be dealing with assembly. So I've got work in process inventory assembly for job one, two, and three for the amounts given in the problem. The sum of that is going to be a credit to raw material inventory. So we increase our work in process inventory accounts 
for the assembly department for 1, 2, and 3, and then we credit the raw material that was released into those departments. So we'll go back to our T accounts here, work in process inventory assembly, job 1, we booked a $500 debit to that, a $1,200 debit to job 2, and a $6,600 debit to job 3. Transaction 3, we have direct labor going on. It says timesheets and payroll summaries indicated that the following direct labor costs were incurred. So they give us for the fab department and the assembly department direct labor costs for job 1, 2, and 3. The problem tells us to assume that these were all accrued, meaning we didn't pay any cash for them. We're just going to set them up as a payable. So the first part of that, we'll have a debit to work in process inventory, fabrication, job 1, for the amount given in the problem, we'll have job two and job three, and we'll credit the sum of those for $9,000. So we'll go back to our journal entries here. Work in process inventory for job one in the fabrication department. We'll add $1,000 to that. Job two, 3,000 will be added to that. And then job three, we'll add 5,000. 1,000, 3, and 5. Second part of that entry is going to look very similar. We'll have WIP inventory for the assembly department, job 1, job 2, and job 3. And again, the offsetting credit, debits and credits always have to equal. Offsetting credit will be to wages payable. We're accruing it, we're not paying cash for it. So if we go back to our T accounts, go down here a little bit, I believe we said 2,400. 3500 and 9500 so we've got those posted transaction 4 the following indirect costs were incurred in each department parts fab and assembly we've got labor utilities and fuel and our depreciation so we're actually recording overhead here this isn't the applied or budgeted this is what actually happened so the journal entry for that it's going to be manufacturing overhead, manufacturing overhead assembly, and then we just kind of add it up. So you say, well, where do these numbers come from? 20,400 manufacturing overhead for the fab department. We just added up the three numbers from the parts fab department, added up the three numbers from the assembly department there. So we do that, and this is kind of the entry that we come up with. Manufacturing overhead debit for the fabrication department. And the assembly department, our wages payable, utilities payable, and our accumulated depreciation. So that is actual overhead. That's what actually took place. Let's go to Act RT accounts. I've got an account set up for manufacturing overhead. For the fab department, we'll book a debit, 20400 And for the assembly department, we'll book a debit, 10400 Transaction number five. Overhead was applied. Okay, so now we're doing the applied overhead thing where we base it on a predetermined or budgeted rate. Overhead was applied based on the rates in effect in each department. In parts fab, we had 200 machine hours at $100 per hour. That info came from the problem. The assembly department had 950 direct labor hours at $10 per hour. And you can see the breakdown per job. So basically for every job, we'll just take the hours and multiply it by the rate and that is what it is going to get booked. So here's what our journal entry is going to look like. We'll have WIP inventory for fabrication, job one, job two, and job three, 2,000, 3,500, and 14,500. And again, those numbers came from 20 times 100, 2,000, 35 times 100, 3,500, 145 times 100, 14,500. So we add all those up and we get manufacturing overhead, fabrication, credit, $20,000. Work in process inventory debits of 2, 3,500, and 14,500 for the three jobs. So we'll head back to our T accounts here and we'll start plugging in some numbers. Book the debit to job one. WIP inventory for the fab department, 3500 for job two, 
14,500 for job three. And the offsetting credit was to manufacturing overhead fabrication, 20,000. Remember back in our earlier chapters, we talked about this overhead account and how this side was a budgeted and this side, the debit side, was actual. And that holds true with what we just looked at right here. So that's the fabrication department. Let's look at the second part of that transaction that deals with the assembly. We'd have a debit for 400, a debit to job 2 for 1100, and a debit to job 3 for 8000, with the offsetting credit going to manufacturing overhead assembly. And those numbers came from the problem. Assembly department, 950 hours, so 40 times 10 was 400, 110 times 10 was 1,100, and 800 times 10 was 8,000. So we'll go back to our T-accounts and book that side of it. Down here with the work in process inventory for the assembly department, job 1, 2, and 3, we had $400 debit to job 1. We had an $1,100 debit to job 2 and an $8,000 debit to job 3. All that's offset with a $9,500 credit to our overhead account for the assembly department. And again, this is our applied or budgeted side, the credit side, debit side, the actual. Okay, so we're on number six now. The light at the end of the tunnel is coming up. We're about done. We just got seven to get through here. Job number one was completed and sold for cash in the amount of the cost plus contract. The problem says they want to make a 25% profit. So basically, we're going to sell it for our cost plus another 25%. At the month end, job two and three were only partially done. So we need to make a journal entry to record the completion of job one the sale of job one and then we're also going to consider what's left in jobs two and three so here's our journal entry to transfer work in process inventory for job one to finish goods so we'd have a debit to finish goods inventory of fourteen thousand three hundred and whip inventory credits to job one for fab and assembly of eleven thousand and thirty three hundred now you say well where do those numbers come from well, let's go back and look at our t accounts when we need to look at job one, that's the one that we're done with. So here we have in job one, if I total this up, in the fab department, 11,000. Okay. Down in the assembly department, I've got 3,300. We're done with job one. So we need to transfer this out. I'll transfer out 11,000 and 3,300. We add those together, that's 14,300 that we are transferring to finish goods inventory. Okay? So now we have nothing left in work in process inventory for job one. We finished it and we've transferred it out to finish goods. 14,300. That's how they get that number. So if we have 14,300 in it and we need to get a 25% profit on the sale, that would be the next part. Here we go. We just take 14,300 times 1.25 or 125%. Actually, that, that should be a 5 right there, that markup. And we get 17,875 in cash and credit revenue. Of course, we got to record the cost of goods sold. That would be the next part. Cost of goods sold, 14300 and we take it out of finished good inventory. So it basically goes from finished goods, once we sell it, into cost of goods sold. Finally, transaction number seven, any underapplied or overapplied overhead at the month end is considered immaterial and thus is going to be closed to cost of goods sold. So again, if we have anything left in that overhead account that's kind of just hanging out there, we have to get rid of it. So let's go back to our T accounts and check those overhead accounts out. Looks to me, if we take a look here, like we've got 400 left in that account, and we've got 
900 left in this account. So to get rid of that, we're going to have to do the opposite. We're going to have to make an entry to the credit side of 400 and to the credit side of 900. And we're going to close that out the cost of goods sold. So we'll be crediting our manufacturing overhead account for 400 and 900 and debiting cost of goods sold 1300. And that's how that's going to look. Cost of goods sold debit 1300 manufacturing overhead for fabrication and assembly 400 and 900 and that closes out our under applied overhead. And finally the final part of the problem wants us to determine the total cost assigned to job 2 and 3 at the end of the month. We got done with the job 1 we have job 2 and 3 kind of hanging out there so what cost do we have in it at the end of the month? Well we'll have material labor and overhead for fabrication and assembly for both jobs. And if you're looking at that wondering well, where do these numbers come from, this is why we did the T accounts. Let's head back to our T accounts. There's your 14,000. That was our direct material for job two. 3,000, there's your direct labor. 3,500, there's your overhead. Direct material for job two and the assembly department. Direct labor and overhead. So job two, fabrication and assembly. There's your job three for the fab department. Direct material, direct labor, overhead, and again for the assembly department, job three, direct material, direct labor, and overhead. That's where all the numbers came from. That's pretty much how a job order costing system is going to go down. We're going to have separate jobs, we're going to count for them separately and kind of gather the cost up separately. We're going to apply overhead as necessary similar uh, to what we did in ABC costing in chapter 4. That's why we studied that before we did the, the job order costing. Uh, that was a lot to take in. If you have any questions about any of that please send me an email, get a hold of me however you want to and we'll try to walk you through it. Uh, good luck on your problems and let me know if you're running into any issues.